this is module 2 if people are not joined before in the module 1 i am just going to do one or two slides duplication just for them to catch up to do but all i request most of your students if not all of you please take a pen and pad because there are something which you may not recollect at the end of the class or after a few weeks after the class it's always nice to review your own handwritten notes especially when you are going for your examination so i strongly advise you uh, start writing along with me wherever i give some time for you to scribble and also try to make some diagrams so that because in exams the surgeon's language is more of uh, like a flow charts and small small diagrams and the steps one by one and two like that it is not like a writing a big essay or uh, what uh, some other uh, specialty they like to do so our style of presentation and writing the exam or presenting in the ward rounds or discussing and during the surgery are slightly different so you need to have a pen and pad with you let me start doing this module i am going to spend about 10 minutes on approach to dyspepsia dyspepsia see for example if you are a resident tomorrow after you qualified uh, your undergraduation working as a crri how you examine a patient presenting with upper abdominal discomfort first case next if that turn out to be a ca stomach how we are managing 2020 year and the third of course the common problem in a general practitioner is management of acid peptic disease how and uh, we are going to manage because there are one or two short notes might come especially the gastric outlet obstruction how we manage that is the important short notes in my opinion and the last to recall today how we did in the 90 minutes of concentration mcq there are five mcq so that's the way we go let's start see all these patients as you can see they are all presented to me in the last few months with the dyspepsia as you can see they can be of varied age group they can be young old male female depending upon the etiology because you understand dyspepsia unlike dysphagia is more broad based syndrome or a symptom complex you can't say it is a single symptom the commonest description a patient with the dyspepsia would explain doctor i have been having an upper abdominal they will put the hand on the epigastrium i have a discomfort or pain in this region a burning pain discomfort in that region they will say sometimes also some people will describe doctor after eating i feel full for example if i had my breakfast at 9 o'clock i don't feel like eating again till 4 or 5 pm in the afternoon so they feel postprandial fullness or they say doctor i feel like eating but as soon as i take my second idli or second dosa i already feel full that is early satiety you know very important function of stomach everybody should understand you know the esophagus what is the function of esophagus recollect it is a just a transit organ as soon as you put the food from the oropharynx into the esophagus because of the powerful peristalsis of esophagus it just sends it there is nothing else esophagus is doing it is only a transit whereas stomach is more than a transit it does a lot of function what are the functions it does it is very important is a reservoir receptive relaxation is a very very important function of the stomach so the stomach may look small to start with but as you start eating second third four five six at least it keep on distending without giving you that fullness until the time where you are really full so that is a receptive relaxation or reservoir next of course it is a mixer it mixes the food like a kind then it transports antral mill what you call an antral mill which sends small aliquots or small small 20 ml 30 ml every time through the pylorus into the duodenum where it mixes rightly with the biliary and pancreatic juices in alkaline environment for digestion to take place and fourth and final thing function stomach all of you know it is an endocrine organ there are a lot of endocrine gland it is one of the endocrine gland all of you know and also it important in production of the b12 so stomach is not just just a storage organ is more than a reservoir so we should understand that so early satiety that is even after eating a small meal you feel full that itself people will describe as a dyspepsia and nausea vomiting sensation after eating is again a 
may be a presentation and the last but not the least is the reflux symptoms sometimes people will complain that doctor i have food last night i went to a restaurant i had some food after that i feel some burning feeling in the epigastric region in the retrosternal region sometimes even i feel little bitterness in my tongue as soon as i go i have what we call a regurgitation or a belching these are the symptoms we'll discuss later of predominantly what we call a gastroesophageal reflux disease g e r d but sometimes people even with a dyspepsia like ulcer patient will have such symptom because of the increased acidity so dyspepsia can be an ulcer dyspepsia dysmotility dyspepsia or reflux dyspepsia these are the three clinical times but as far as the patient is concerned this is the way they describe if your patient describe any of any of this the very important point you have to understand and ask the patient is please put your hand where you feel the discomfort in your stomach invariably most of the people if they have a problem with the stomach they usually put the hand over the epigastric region why is that do you know this is the where you need to understand and very very important a simple slide for you to understand what is a visceral pain what is a parietal pain see visceral pain is mainly because of the visceral organ like esophagus stomach liver pancreas small bowel large bowel these are all viscera parietal peritoneum that is a parietal organ it is somatic nerve supply visceral it is a eh, vagal nerve afferent and efferents are there sympathetic and parasympathetic some so visceral pain the characteristic of visceral pain is they are ill defined dull aching or colicky type of pain they are vis when they say ill defined they are as you can see in the top slide here they are either present predominantly in the epigastrium especially any visceral viscera in our body which is developed from your foregut so that's where you have to recollect as i as i told you a surgeon should have a good understanding of not only the anatomy but also some amount of embryology so if you recollect your embryology what are the things developed from foregut if you don't remember just to recollect what are the areas the celiac artery which is the artery of the foregut supplies then you remember it is the esophagus stomach duodenum up to the ampulla vitae that is first part and the proximal half of the second part and of course from the second part only the liver bud hepatic bud pancreatic bud comes and the pancreas liver develops so any patient having disease of the liver like gallstone pancreas like pancreatitis duodenal ulcer gastric ulcer reflux esophagitis where do you think they complain of pain it is almost always somewhere where the green color that is in the upper abdomen so that's why you have to differentiate whether it is a gastric esophageal depending upon further history next of course is peri umbilical pain like here any organ or viscera developed from the mid gut supplied by the superior mesenteric artery which is an artery of the mid gut that is rest of the duodenum whole of the small bowel appendix ascending colon then the right side that is one third of the the transverse colon because rest of the transverse colon and the descending colon rectum everything is developed from hind gut where the blood supply is inferior mesenteric artery accordingly you remember an acute appendicitis they usually have a classical visceral pain to start with that is peri umbilical pain later if the parietal peritoneum in the right leg fossa is inflamed then they will develop a mcburney sign that is a right leg fossa pain so shifting pain is characteristic of appendicitis initially peri umbilical then localized to the right leg fossa that is visceral pain turning into a parietal pain so all these things you will understand by this important slide so you have to understand this embryology for rest of your life okay let us move on now right now i told you you have a patient standing or sitting in front of you with a dyspepsia he says doctor i have a pain in my upper abdomen so what is the likely cause for this the likely common cause for upper abdominal discomfort as far as you are concerned is one a benign pathology that is aseptic disease or a malignant pathology that is carcinoma stomach 
but as you become a practitioner as a general practitioner later you know even otherwise you know already most of you sometimes when you had some food outside the restaurant or in your own canteen sometimes if you took something which is not suiting your stomach you will have a condition called functional dyspepsia what is functional dyspepsia you will not have any ulcer in the stomach it is mainly because of the indigestion for a day or two once the stress or the food which is all digested you feel better so that is a functional dyspepsia that is quite common but for exam going student for you you need to understand the first two but there are lots of differential diagnosis which i have written on the right side that is a less common thing but you have to keep it as a differential diagnosis any patient with the ulcer dyspepsia you have to consider a flatulent dyspepsia of gallstone disease because gallstone also can present with epigastric pain right upper quadrant pain radiating to the right shoulder right scapula associated with vomiting that is a classical biliary colic so again pancreatitis you know chronic pancreatitis upper abdominal pain especially after taking a fatty meal or after a bout of alcoholism severe upper abdominal pain radiating right through the back because pancreas is in the stomach bed it is behind the stomach retroperitoneum so you feel pain more on your back and also you feel better on falling forward like kneeling forward like that classical pain pancreatitis so in other words everybody they start having an epigastric pain but if you ask additional symptoms or radiation and association with the food or recent food history or alcohol history you will be able to distinguish an ulcer pain from a gallstone pain pancreatitis pain and other pains there are other things are also there in the list but for undergraduate level they are not necessary let us go for example if you have a dyspepsia that is an upper abdominal pain how do you differentiate doctor whether it is a simple ulcer like a aseptic ulcer like a duodenal ulcer or can it be a cancer stomach presenting as a dyspepsia if you ask me you have to ask every patient with the upper abdominal discomfort where you suspect ulcer the following six question what are they whether the dyspepsia was a only recent one especially elderly because if i am like for example 40 year old or a 50 year old if i say doctor i have been having this upper abdominal discomfort for the last 10 years every 3 months 4 months whenever i go out for a marriage or some function or somewhere travel i eat some food which is not suiting to my stomach i get pain then i'll take some pantosweet or ranitidine i feel better like that they'll give a recurrent dyspepsia whereas if a patient say doctor i never had this problem this is entirely new especially a person in their 50s new dyspepsia after 50 consider it can be an alarm symptom or it is giving a warning it can be a cancer or if dyspepsia is associated with significant weight loss define significant weight loss take it down more than 5 kilos in the last 3 months vomiting is not a symptom of simple dyspepsia could be a symptom of malignancy or if they have associated dysphagia or if they have associated gi blood loss like hematemesis or melina like a dark tarry sticky stool or if patient says doctor my father or my mother my uncle had a cancer stomach and uh, i had some pain now i am wondering whether i have a, a cancer he is right in thinking because there is a familial incidence familial cancers are known in two important conditions all of you should know one first thing is of course ca breast that's right second important thing you should always say is ca colon these are the two common things cancer stomach can have that occur but it is not that common okay it is third or fourth in your list so you have to see tell me classical familial cancer family history of cancer where it is important if anybody ask you immediately come out in a female it is always breast male it is a always almost always colonic cancer of course some people will say doctor i have been having some swelling in my epigastric region or they may say doctor i have a swelling in my left supraclavicular region or i feel jaundice they may be the late presentation of cancer also 
Sometimes they may present silently a cancer, but only presenting with advanced disease like this. So you need to ask this alarm symptoms and signs. Okay. And the next important thing you have to ask is, we'll move on to the CA stomach. For example, if I am going to CA stomach now, that I asked you in CA esophagus for people coming for the module two first time, they may find it difficult, but this is the same template we used last time. So the same template if you use for every essay, then it will be easy. Okay, so we'll use this template and carry on. See, for example, CA stomach, which country it is quite rampant, if you ask me. One country, if you want to remember, it is Japan. Because Japan, or even in Asia, Southeast Asia, like uh, Korea, China, they're all included, but Japan, one country. Because they like what we call the pickled fish or smoked fish. That's that delicacy. Of course, to remember the predisposing factors or risk factors for developing cancer stomach. I told you for esophagus, what is a thing mnemonic we told you just to recollect people? It is A, B, C, D, isn't it? Same way, here it is all five Ps. Pickled fish, pernicious anemia, H. pylori organisms, because H. pylori is a very, very important. Uh, okay, it is a chemical, or, I mean, the, it's very important, you know, carcinogen, proven carcinogen. And also presence of polyps anywhere, okay, especially if it is in the stomach, it turns into polypoidal cancer. Then any post-operative stomach, because for example, if the patient says, I had a stomach surgery for an ulcer with a gastrojejunostomy 10 years ago, now there is every chance he may have a cancer stomach because bile itself is a carcinogen. So bile reflux, gastritis, intestinal metaplasia. You know how the cancer develops? Always there is a dysplasia, then metapla sorry, metaplasia, dysplasia, cancer in situ, cancer. This is the way, everywhere. It is very well proven in the carcinoma colon, carcinoma cervix, to some extent rest of the GI tract. I told you already, CA stomach, CA small bowel, large bowel, they are all adenocarcinoma, almost always. Rarely you have lymphoma also. Coming to the pathology, that's why we say the pathology, whatever you read in your pathology class, for example, third year, you have to bring it in here. But from the surgeon's perspective, what do you mean by surgeon's perspective? Whenever pathology you are writing, you write in three important headings, even in surgency. Macroscopically, that is, you take a specimen of a gastrectomy done for a CA stomach and cut the specimen, for example. You see how it will look like. Borman's classification. If you remember the name, well and good. Otherwise, as last class, you tell it looks polypoidal, projecting, ulcerative, infiltrative. These are the three classical types. If you remember that, well and good. This infiltrative type of carcinoma stomach is called lineitis plastica. They'll ask you, what is lineitis plastica? You say, lineitis plastica is nothing but infiltrative type of carcinoma stomach, which is a poor prognostic cancer because usually it is histologically, that is microscopically, if you see, it is a diffuse signet cell type, signet cell type, okay? And also, they'll give a classical appearance if you do a barium meal. I'll come to later, but I want to summarize everything here. That is leather bottle stomach. So, lineitis plastica, the word if examiner asks in the viva, you have to immediately tell, it is an infiltrative type of cancer stomach. It is a poorly differentiated cancer stomach. It is advanced to cancer. Lineitis plastica. This is all will come in your mind. Okay. So that's the way you have to understand. Microscopically, if you see under microscopy, it is all glandular pattern, adenocarcinoma. That is, it can be high grade or poorly differentiated or moderately differentiated. Okay. Then there is a special classification as far as the CA stomach is concerned. Probably you might have read it in your pathology class. That is Lawrence DIO classification. DIO stands for diffuse, I stands for intestinal, O stands for others type. Out of them, intestinal type is usually a better prognosis. 
diffuse type like lineage dysplastic eye is poorly demonstrated that is a poor prognosis in our country for example we see more of a diffuse type okay that's why we say it is all advanced cancer in our country whereas in japan they get it early one case is because of that in screening program i told you already the importance of screening in for example ca breast screening united kingdom ca colon colonoscopy usa and uh, ca cervix india like that japan they do a stomach that is gastroscopy and also earlier they used to do a barium also study now they go for only gastroscopy for all screening because so common in japan the carcinoma stomach and so early they so they have a different classification of ca stomach it is not the one macroscopically they have a different type 1 type 2 type 3 they have a different type i'll come to that later the spread also how they spread ca stomach if you asked me they spread directly for example from the stomach all the layers of the stomach it can start as a mucosa submucosal tumor but it can go transmurally to the serosa and it becomes adherent to the neighbors like pancreas very important neighbor it will or it will infiltrate into the neighboring blood vessels so direct spread then lymphatic through the perigastric peri gastric blood vessel along the blood vessel like celiac artery branches the lymphatics go along that the nodal spread blood spread it is almost always portal venous circulation because of that the secondary is first time where you see it is almost always in the liver okay so any colonic gastric cancer secondary is first filter liver second filter is lung whereas ca that is nephro i mean the adenocarcinoma or renal cell carcinoma the first filter itself or a testicular carcinoma the first filter itself is lung so that is a different the fourth peculiar transmission or the spread is of course transcelomic spread that is i told you already once the serosa of the stomach is involved you have to visualize then the peritoneum is involved in the peritoneum the exfoliated cells gravitate down into the pelvis there they present as a pelvic deposits in the when you do a rectal examination then you can see in the pouch of douglas in uh, in the women and also in the recto vesical pouch in the men you can see some fullness and also in the ovary also krukenberg tumor see one of the common reason for bilateral krukenberg tumor is nothing but the secondary deposits secondary to ca stomach other conditions can cause krukenberg tumors commonly is ca breast you should remember next how do you suspect or how do carcinoma stomach patients come to you then if they ask you that is what patients symptoms and what you elicit is signs let us start with the symptoms the simplest thing for all of you is every day we eat dosa so you remember dosa what is dosa patient can present like a ulcer type that is dyspepsia type like doctor i have been having severe upper abdominal pain and i have been losing weight like that they can present second type is o that is obstructive type imagine if there is a tumor here in the stomach obstructing the cardia see you know this is the cardia of the stomach fundus of the stomach body of the stomach pyloric antrum then this is true pylorus if you imagine if there is a tumor in the antrum i mean sorry uh, fundus and the cardia then it will cause obstruction to the gastroesophageal junction so the patient will have of course dysphagia very easy to understand same way if you imagine the same cancer if it is somewhere in this region what will happen the food will not be able to go beyond into the duodenum so they'll have vomiting so antral tumor so obstructive type two types of obstructive type or if they are like this large ulcer silently growing okay so they may cause bleeding and then they can present as anemia or they may present as anorexia so they can present silently only present later with a nodal secondary or epigastric mass that's a, i mean the secret or the serious nature sometimes stomach cancer because patients if they are not having say they always saying oh it is just a simple dyspepsia they keep taking some tablets come to you after 6 months silently it is growing to an advanced stage that is the thing if you want to remember 
as a mnemonic stomach also you can do for symptoms like they can present silently as i said and presenting as secondary later or they can present as epigastric mass obstructive future as i told you or gi bleed because of the ulcerative lesion like melina or hematomyces or anemia and cancer cachexia any patient with a cancer they'll have a significant weight loss from a distance you can find out carcinoma stomach carcinoma pancreas carcinoma esophagus as they walk into your room you can see the way they appear the i mean the disease look in their face okay the anxious look intron cheeks weight loss everything will give you oh this is a malignant cachexia that uh, i mean what we call uh, you will have that uh, hunch once you ha- start seeing this patient as soon as a patient comes and utter few words in the symptoms you will be able to guess yes i have to take this patient seriously he is likely to have a underlying malignant process it is not too difficult once you get more and more experience coming to the experience i mean the examination i told you in ca esophagus nothing much to examine because you know esophagus is in the thoracic cavity whereas in abdomen stomach it is very important long case those days even now i think if you have a classical case of carcinoma stomach presenting as epigastric mass or presenting as a liver secondaries or ascites or supraclavicular which shows notes they can be kept as a case for you so uh, there are four classical exam cases so see a stomach read very well in my opinion so general examination examination of abdomen general examination you go by see always you remember what you hold you look for anemia cyanosis clubbing same way you think but two important findings you always find in patient with the carcinoma stomach is anemia under trousier sign that is which shows note then abdomen you write the headings always try to write inspection palpation percussion auscultation then automatically uh, you will can visualize this picture and the findings you can automatically fill in if it is a ca stomach inspection the stomach is in the epigastrium so epigastric mass or epigastric fullness palpation i will feel a ill defined epigastric mass firm epigastric mass and you may sometimes have a liver a secondary liver usually it is a what how will you like it is a large painless hard liver nodular liver so it is hard in consistency nodularity will be there painless to feel so liver why you do know it is liver because in the right upper quarter moves easily with the respiration you can go and see the upper border of the liver tunnels lower border how many finger breath below the costal margin all those things you have to look for so when you describe everything you have to go for the order everything you repeatedly keep on practicing the same way so when in exam it just like a flow it will come freely for you then percussion always percuss because people with the ca stomach very often they have ascites and if it is a massive ascites you go for a what you go for yes fluid thrill if it is a mini moderate amount septic tunnels if it is a very very small amount 200 ml 300 ml what will you do there is no need in exam to say that sometimes they ask you what other signs are there to examine for a small amount of fluid that is puddle sign what is puddle sign make the patient in knee elbow position then percuss in the peri umbilical region you will feel that it will be dull now but why don't we do puddle sign now because it is very very cumbersome for the patient discomfort to the patient moreover with the advent of ultrasound which will be able to determine even a small amount of fluid in the peritoneal cavity so that's why puddle sign is not given that much importance but it is nice to know there are signs of course auscultation to completion sake nothing much in patient with a benign gastric ulcer with a gastric outlet obstruction sometimes you can have a succussion flash so what is succussion flash within stomach distended stomach there is a fluid that will give you that noise but those things may not be present in the ca stomach but you can mention that also then rectal examination i told you already the importance is for rectal examination pelvic deposit pouch of douglas deposit now next so you have got the symptoms you examine the patient what is the next thing to do use investigate investigate and treat don't treat straight away the investigation always comes from the 
minor to major that is blood investigation hematological biochemical then imaging in the imaging non invasive invasive less expensive more expensive that's the way you have to go then special investigation what do you mean by special the investigation of choice for the particular condition mcq question very often on special investigation then of course some people if you have done so well in the exam they'll ask you some reason or additions it is not for ev everybody if you have got 80 marks they want to give you 90 or 100 marks then they might ask you all these things better to know okay for completion hematological they invariably all these people will have microcytic hypochromic anemia so don't write full blood count you write the finding also it will give you that extra mark in other words keep on writing whatever you know then you will be surprised how much you could remember if you know the template you can fill everything appropriately nobody will find fault you are writing something which is not necessary everything is done because this is the way we treat liver function test every ca stomach patients i do liver function test we look for abnormal sgot sgpt and bilirubin if the bilirubin is high sgpt and ot is high that means it is a infiltrative liver disease because of secondaries if there are obstructive jaundice it will be different isn't it alkaline phosphatase will be raised in obstructive jaundice if it is a hepatitis or infiltrative like a tumor infiltration it will be sgot sgpt will be also increased in addition and they will be having a direct bilirubin slightly increased more more important for you is of course is the barium meal ultrasound ct i told you already two things barium is always important barium swallow for esophagus barium meal for stomach barium meal series for small bowel barium enema for large intestine ultrasound for everybody ct abdomen for all cancer all retroperitoneal tumor all acute abdomen we do see if you remember these three oncological cases or any patient with any abdominal mass where you want to do a staging or anybody with a retroperitoneal mass or anybody with acute abdomen where you suspect whether it is a what is a pathology we do that so nowadays most of the time we do ct so ct then only patient comes to ot that is the dictum in most of the uh, usa and uh, advanced countries even in our country now we use this uh, technology especially you know in the covid era you know the ct screening of the chest will rule out whether you have any evidence, indirect evidence of covid infection in your chest so ct has a lot of advantages by that way and most important thing as for the ca stomach is concerned for you is it assess the operability of the tumor very very important and also it helps us for tnm staging these are the two important thing you have to mention i'll explain to you later again now coming to the barium first okay and the reason addition, addition also i'll tell you here itself sometimes we do also staging laparoscopy and rarely we do a pet ct i told do, told you already pet ct is very very important for lymphoma carcinoma breast these are the two things i think every oncologist will do two classical indication but all other conditions even in all ga malignancies in our days increasing a number of uh, cases like ca stomach wheat because it gives you the quantum of the disease in a patient okay by all i mean so it quantifies the disease the oncologically and it's able to because before you do a new adjuvant treatment and things like that uh, we like to have an idea with a pet ct for these people now let us go for more important thing as far as you are concerned that is the barium meal in barium meal you'll have a classically what do you have like what this one that is you'll have a filling defect especially if it is a ca stomach in the distal this is the antrum of the stomach this is the fundus body filled with the the white color barium paste and this area dark color these are all not filled because this is a tumor is filling the so you have a filling defect so this area is not filled by the barium and also it is irregular and it is not i mean it is persisting filling defect very very important term why because if you have a peristalsis like visible gastric peristalsis that will give you sometimes an apparent filling defect that is different so if it is persisting that's why 
they have to take a film in various like uh, 15 minutes half an hour one hour one and a half hours two hours like that we who do every 15 minutes interval a barium meal so that day we know if the defect i mean the filling defect is persistent and also it is irregular then it is carcinoma stomach what other findings you will have you will have another classical thing is i told you already is leather bottle stomach the leather bottle stomach is what is a leather bottle is this one what the people in desert uh, riding in the camel they take the water see in this leather bottle what is the uh, thing classical feature of leather bottle it has no distensibility it is so contracted small compact one it is like a compact box so the stomach if you see this is the pathology specimen cut the formalin in the formalin so you can see the thickness of the stomach is so much because of the infiltrative nature of the cancer and it loses its distensibility the stomach will distend even up to 1 to 1.5 liter if you drink 1 liter of the water it distends to that capacity isn't it but here in patients with the ca i mean stomach especially of line it is plastic uh, the stomach will be thick walled see the thick walled stomach this is a stomach is thickness is close to a centimeter normally the thickness of the wall is like this see this is the thickness of the large intestine i just want to tell you this here i am showing you it is a small bubble see small bubble loops so they are all so you can see what i am going the arrow i am pointing this is the wall and what you see at the dark black color this is the content this is the air within the small bubble air large bubble air small bubble wall large bubble wall as if drawn by a pencil whereas here stomach air stomach wall the stomach wall is so thick comparison as if it is 1 cm thickness that amount of thickness will give you this classical barium also see only the fundus of the stomach is filled with barium rest the body and from they are all contracted not able to distend so this is the classical infiltrative type of cancer so two radiological finding in uh, esophagus and a two radiological finding here i'll come to that in a minute see this particular take down in your little pad and pen if you have esophagus rat tail appearance where you see yes ca esophagus bird beak appearance where you see achalasia cardia well done ca stomach very a male what are the findings you see persistent irregular filling defect just now i mentioned second is leather bottle appearance whereas if it is a benign ulcer i am going to discuss later what findings we see here is all i mentioned it is called niche and notch what is niche and notch will discuss later then for completion there are two classical findings in small bowel series of small i mean the small i mean the barium meal series of small bowel that is string sign of contour that is in crohn's disease then pulled up cecum with a obtuse ileocecal angle as you see in ileocecal tuberculosis large intestine what are the barium enema findings for exam going students apple correlation apple will come only for large bowel tumor classically described especially the ascending colon tumor pincer shaped deformity or coiled spring sign that is for what condition intussusception then lead pipe sign what is lead pipe sign in ulcerative colitis so we we are going to discuss all this and again and again this is just to one snapshot of the whole important radiological finding as an undergraduate student you have to see in real life or able to describe classically then they will tell us yes, this student is i mean knows some common radiological sign at undergraduate standard in my opinion see for example here again and the c even though it is a ct i tell you this is the normal thickness of the stomach wall see and this is the thickness where the cancer see this is the fundus body and antrum you can see the antrum of the stomach thickness so after sometimes if you keep seeing the ct cross section you will be able to understand this actually is section of your body across the upper abdomen if you see section across the abdomen so i'll tell you this is the vertebra all of you the patient had a contrast so because of the contrast you are able to see the iota 
this is the crura here crura crura you are able to see this is the ivc you are able to see and you are able to see the stomach and you are just you are seeing the stake off of the celiac plexus here so if you go further down superior mesenteric artery and pancreas will come so this cut section is done right at the where the stomach and you can see a glimpse of the liver of course the gall bladder and you can see a spleen i mean uh, appearing also here so each section gradually and also you can see a little bit of large intestine with a gas that is a omental fat parietal wall so all these things you slowly you start assimilating the finding over a period of many years i'm sure you'll be able to interpret radiologically now coming to the ct abdomen what is the importance of the ct abdomen in a patient with a c stomach i told you already tnm staging because i told you esophagus cancer if you remember t and t1 t2 t3 t4 if it is invading the muscle layer t2 if it breaching right up to the serosa t3 if the neighbors are involved here the neighbor is pancreas if it is infiltrated to the pancreas stomach it is t4 so all these things you can find out here nodal enlargement yes you can find out liver secondary is yes you can find out. tnm everything you'll find out by ct the most important thing of course is a resectability of the tumor see very very important see for example if it is a stomach cancer if it goes outside the stomach involving the vessels like a celiac plexus region or if it becomes like a single mass then you can say i can't remove the whole thing like a n block without causing damage to the superior mesenteric artery or celiac artery plexus so it is very very easy for the surgeon whether the tumor is resectable or not the one important thing you have to word you have to understand at your level is vascular invasion and also local infiltration the local infiltration here is a pancreas vascular invasion is the celiac and superior mesenteric artery if vascular invasion is there that is a indirect evidence this tumor cannot be operated safely without endangering the patient's life so that we say it is only palliation not resection of course if you have a distal metastasis like in these regions like liver ovary and lung of course or if the patient has a uh, other deposits like peritoneal deposits sometimes peritoneal deposits you will be able to see but what is the best investigation for identifying whether you have a peritoneal deposit anybody it is not ct it is not your mri it is the staging laparoscopy so that's why staging laparoscopy what is the benefit patient with the ca pancreas when we discuss pancreas i'll tell you or ca stomach where we are discussing now if before surgery if you put a just a small hole in the umbilical region put the diagnostic laparoscopy have a look any seedling on the surface of the peritoneum or liver you'll be able to diagnose those things which could have been missed in the ct scan so the ct scan has so many advantages but the limitation of course is it is not full proof to identify peritoneal metastasis that is what you need to understand here i am going to but what is the most important test you have to do in all ca stomach before surgery that is the test of choice is of course endoscopy and biopsy if you see here you are able to see a tumor at 9 o'clock position here i am taking a forceps through the endoscopy take a bit from the edge of the lesion because center area see this is all white necrotic tumor this is all the viable tumor this is the normal stomach so we have to go always whenever there is a tumor it is always a wedge biopsy from the edge of the lesion okay how many biopsies we take multiple biopsy how many bites more than 6 to 8 okay we have done a maneuver to see see this is the classical large infiltrative tumor in the incisura of the stomach or a distal stomach and and going up to the even the right up to the cardia okay so fairly large tumor so the staging has to be done by a ct of course next important thing is now coming to the important aspect for a ca stomach is treatment for undergraduate level i'll make it easy for you this may look a very busy slide because i put everything in a single slide for you to understand but if you recollect what we discussed in 
esophageal CA, it's the same way you discuss. Every oncological problem, whether it's a CA breast, esophagus, stomach, colon, is always multimodal, multidisciplinary. First word you write it. Multimodal means surgery is offered as a first line, of course, but radiotherapy, chemotherapy has a role to play. That is a multimodal. Multidisciplinary. So a surgeon unilaterally, we are not taking a decision to operate. We get the oncosurgeon or oncologist involved and we get the radiotherapist also consulted. Onco nurse also is involved because sometimes, especially not in the stomach to large extent, but if it is a CA breast mastectomy, patient has to understand. CA colon, when you do a colostomy, stoma care, a stoma therapy should be I mean, understood by the patient. So there, the nurse role is more. And a psychologist, all those things are important. So it is a multi, it is like tumor board. We call it as a tumor board. So tomorrow, if I am going to operate, or a few days before any intervention, we sit together and custom made, when I made a custom made for a given patient with all the CT histological findings put on the uh, discussion forum, I decide this is best possible treatment protocol. We write everything in the patient case sheet, discussed with the radiologist, oncologist like that, and this is what we, so this is what we call a treatment plan. Then we execute the plan. So this is what you need to write in the introduction of the treatment. For every oncological cases you write, you will get a good marks. Coming to the surgery, always surgery is curative, palliative. When you say curative, you need to know where cure is not possible. Where cure is not possible, when you have an advanced cancer. What are the signs of advanced cancer? Handful of findings. Always remember your hand. Liver secondary is very important, thumb. You never forget your thumb. And other four, of course, is clinically, if you see a patient has a gross ascites, rectal examination shows a pelvic deposits, or if the patient has clinically or radiologically, if the CT already available shows a local fixity or invasion to the uh, vessels or if you see a virtuous node small bubble then that patient is not possible you need to I mean will be able to cure him so palliative treatment like a bypass or a suction so when you do a curative treatment for CA stomach what we do for all cancer what we do is always we radically we remove that organ what do you mean by radical surgery everybody it is an end block we take the tumor along with the draining lymph nodes like a radical mastectomy like that here also we take not end block but we take the organ along with the draining lymph nodes then once you remove the organ you need to reconstruct the area in other words the esophagus is there stomach you remove so how you are going to continue the transit of the food so you need to establish the continuity of the gi tract so that's where the reconstruction the commonest single word, the, the key word for all of you to remember is we do what we call radical D2 gastrectomy. So what is radical D2 gastrectomy? Let us understand first. For undergraduate level, this is an essence. Whenever we do any procedure, we here, for example, in esophagus also I told you, we give clearance. What is the clearance we give? at least five centimeter clearance all around. So I told you a five centimeter tumor in the esophagus, you give clearance, 15, 20 centimeter gone. So up to, subtotal or total esophagectomy, stomach is pulled up as a gastric tube. Same way here, when you remove the tumor, gastric tumor, you have to do either a total or a subtotal gastrectomy. Less than that is not advisable for a cancer stomach. Okay, so you remove the most of the reservoir. Then what do you do? You have to clear the draining lymph nodes. You see here the two pictures, D1, that is the perigastric lymph nodes, okay, they are all given a number from number one to six. And there are lymph nodes along the blood vessel, named blood vessels to the stomach. For example, the left gastric, hepatic, and also the splenic. These are all named vessels from the celiac plexus. So those, anything around that area also given a number. In other words, they are called, according to the Japanese, lymph node station. For undergraduates, if you know, there are lymph node station number one, 
to 11. For palliative or a benign tumor, we do a D1 gastrectomy. There we do only 1 to 6. Whereas if you remove all the lymph node station from 1 to 11, all the lymph node station, not only perigastric, but also perivascular, that is branches of celiac axis, then that is called a the D2, this is the D2 or N2 lymph node. So, they remove all those things. So, D2 gastrectomy. Then once you have done this, the rest of the stomach, how you establish the gastrointestinal continuity, we do two procedures, either one of them. One is called Bilroth 2, another is Ru N Y. These are the two important words you need to understand. For a first timer, it may be difficult, but we'll take it slowly. What is important in radical is we clear the tumor so that we achieve what is important is good loco that is a tumor in the stomach regional that is a lymph nodal draining lymph nodes you get a good loco regional control that is the aim of your discussion i mean the uh, dissection so bildroth all of you should remember theodore bildroth of vienna austria he described two types of gastrectomy Okay, 100 years ago, actually those days where it is the anesthesia is at the beginning and how he managed to do an operation where people are able to survive is itself is a master class. So here he did a procedure initially that is called a Bildrad 1. What is Bildrad 1? He removed the stomach but he rejoined the duodenum back to the stomach. So the gastro duodenal continuity is restored. So here if you do an endoscopy or if the patient takes food, the food finds its normal pathway. Only difference is the capacity of the stomach is now less than normal. Instead of four idlis, only two idli capacity. But you know, stomach will have distant. After a few years, you see the stomach will have the same receptive relaxation capacity. But that is different. Bildrath 1 is now reserved only for a benign pathology. Okay, like a stricture, of the stomach because of corrosive stricture or a peptic ulcer, not for a malignant pathology. For a CA stomach, we can't because we do what we call a subtotal or a total gastrectomy. So we need to uh, do a something different. That is, one is Bildroth 2 gastrectomy. What is Bildroth 2 gastrectomy? So here, carefully you watch. He removed the stomach here, okay, and after removing the stomach, he disconnected the duodenum. You have to imagine that D1. And he just closed the duodenum like this. So stomach of the removal is closed and the duodenum closed. This is called a duodenal stump. The D1 is closed. Then he took the proximal jejunum, anastomose either in front or behind the transverse colon, either anticholic, that is in front of the colon, or retrocolic, behind the colon. There are two words, surgeons very fond. So that's why we always tell undergraduates, you try to put some words whenever you write. Some words, they are what we call the, the language of the surgeon. You have to learn and speak even during viva, also when you write in your essays. Then people see, even one word means a lot. So here it is a anticholic. You can see the jejunum is coming in front of the transverse colon. If you put the same thing in a dotted line, even a diagram, that is, it is going through the transverse mesocolon, it will come behind also, you can do anatomically. If you watch one or two cases, if you have an option, videos also you watch. So here is a gastric content. Once you have a food, the food actually enters the small bowel directly. And here there are two loops of small bowel. Now you understand two terminologies again. One, of course, is a, all of you, is efferent loop, E, afferent loop. What is afferent loop? See, when food goes here, it goes distally into the small bowel, into the ileum for digestion, the afferent loop. Whereas, as food goes down this way through the peristalsis, this, once the signal goes, the bile pancreatic juice secreted from here, it will be from waiting. And once it is not finding any food coming there, it will just start going through the third part, fourth part, chasing the food. So this is actually bile chasing the food. So normally food goes, mixes with the bile and, and the pancreatic juice and goes as a unit. They all go together. 
but here food goes first while chase so this is otherwise called bilrath too is actually while chasing operation what we are doing is we are dumping the food in the stomach the food is dumped into the small intestine so sometimes you have this bilrath too a problem after surgery that is called a dumping syndrome you will understand what is dumping because the stomach is very very important organ it is not only a reservoir it only by an antral mill it sends 20 30 ml at a time into the duodenum periodically through the pyloric whereas here the whole thing whatever you eat for at least you have another two day two or three minutes the whole thing is goes here so it dumped inside high carbo content there it can cause you to have hypoglycemia even sometimes hypermotility and you have to rush to the toilet for a diarrhea post prandial diarrhea is one of the common dumping syndrome i mean symptoms so all these things are problem with the builder of the two but this is a small penalty to pay by the price because the cancer if you, you are how to remove a full clearance there is no other alternative go for a bilrath 2 but there is another problem with this bilrath 2 so this is what we do so we remove this cancer then we do a that is stump closed and then stomach also stapled then you just to do an anastomosis so you see the bile how it goes food out how it goes so this is the way we do procedure this is a very complex diagram unless you draw yourself in a picture either later today or tomorrow it is very difficult for you to understand but i'll try to make it simple for you this is what we call ru n y esophago jejunostomy done after total gastrectomy for carcinoma see carefully here in a uh, two the problem is the bile will come here 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 at the enters the stomach okay because of the entry here okay and it will cause bile reflux gastritis so because of that people will have some problem so for that reason so they have done this procedure so what is this procedure is going to help you in what way here the duodenal stump is as it is but the jejunum instead of going into as a gj it is actually jj instead of gj you are making a jejuno jejunostomy and this jejunum is brought here so esophago jejunostomy and jejuno jejunostomy these are the two things we do so the jejunum is disconnected about 2 feet below the duodeno jejunal junction and it is brought the distal part of the jejunum is brought in see you have to see the numbers you have to spend some time to understand the c that is a distal part of the jejunum goes here and joins so food from esophagus goes into that distal jejunum like that a food will go like that then the bile will go and mixes it is something like a glorified bilrath two type but here the bile will not have because bile will not reflux this way into esophagus the chances so you don't have bile reflux esophagitis so this is a ideal operation especially when you are doing a subtotal or total gastrectomy ru and y technically demanding but very very rewarding long term symptom i mean relief from the patient's perspective okay this is another subtotal gastrectomy with the ru and y but you may think one you have to suture two anastomosis third anastomosis all these things so so many anastomosis takes time but thanks to the staple see you have to see staple anastomosis hand anastomosis laparoscopic procedure endoscopic procedure like that there are very here we do most of them either a open surgery or laparoscopic surgery so laparoscopic d2 gastrectomy or and i mean laparotomy and then open d2 gastrectomy these are the two things we do coming to the last slide that is in the ca stomach in addition to surgery any role for radiotherapy in the past we used to do even intraoperative now there is little role whereas esophagus chemo radiation is very very important because mostly predominantly a squamous cell carcinoma chemotherapy but here in stomach it has a prominent role as a adjuvant especially there are two regimes which worth remembering fam regime is more common 
I think ECF also. These are the pneumonics to remember. That five fluoride uracil, adriamycin, mitomycin C. The commonest question they'll ask you is whenever we give adriamycin because it is cardiotoxic, you may have to do an echocardiography, a cardiac index. You have to see the echo and the patient's ejection fraction. You have to see. Five fluoride uracil, you may have to give. Okay. And you have to give some folic acid rescue. You have to give folic acid. Otherwise, you may have trouble like that. There are some important treatment, important side effects, and important pre chemotherapy investigation. You have to understand all those things. But I, I think when come, we discuss the chemotherapy as a whole later, we'll discuss. The ECF is epirubicin cisplatin. Cisplatin is a very, very common drug for GA malignancy to be used. Okay. So, coming to the last one, of course. Every patient, when they have a surgery done, come back post-operatively to you uh, for suture removal, they ask you, doctor, what is my pathology report? Uh, is it good? How long I got to live? They may ask a direct question if they're knowledgeable, but you have to have a report in front of you, that's a pathology report, that will tell you the TNM staging of the lesion and also the grade of the tumor. Because whenever examiner asks you, how will you know the prognosis of CA stomach, CA esophagus, CA breast, everything? You always say it depends upon the two important things, stage of the disease, grade of the tumor. In some tumor, in addition, there is something else also. What are the additional things? That is estrogen and progesterone. That is a receptor status. If it is a hormone responsive lesion. And if it is an operated cases, you always tell there is another important prognostic indicator if I have done a surgery. The two important prognostic indicator I will always watch for is we have done a D2 gastrectomy, isn't it? So we see the report carefully whether how many no lymph nodes source evidence of tumor in the gastric. See, we have removed the tumor's lymph node station number 1 to 11 individually. If they say, in station four, station six, all having tumor. That means more the number, more the higher the station, over the prognosis. Nodal positivity is a poor prognosis. Second, if your margin of the stomach, if you remove, that also seems to have still some tumor. That is a bad news for the patient. So margin positivity, we should not get especially when you have done a total gastrectomy that should not be a problem some people will do a limited gastrectomy end up having a margin positivity so there also prognosis could be poor but we have to understand at the end of the day still esophagus stomach pancreas especially in our country they do badly like you have a uniformly you can tell boldly five year survival revolving around about 10 percent Okay, five to ten percent at the maximum. But if you have done a good curative resection, if the node are negative, they can survive even up to forty to fifty percent. Japanese they claim up to sixty percent. So, but you have to speak for our country. So the, these are all poor prognostic tumor. The only way we get a better prognosis is by detecting these cases, picking them early like a stage one, T1, N0, M0, like that. So that is the early tumor. If you're able to do surgery or treatment, probably you'll be able to get something, okay? So that, I think we have uh, uh, come to the more or less two third of our class. I have another 30 minutes for the discussion of the another chapter that is a acid peptic disease. But I think we'll break for about five minutes for a discussion or inputs. Anybody, you can unmute Rajaram, and I can see all our uh, colleagues and Melvisher. I can see Sendhil Raj from Kolkata. Sendhil, how are you? You can unmute yourself. You can put some input as a postgraduate. Uh, how do you find the standard of, uh, I mean, is it above undergraduate standard or on par or for postgraduate like you? How you find it? Is it a recollection? You are already have done your exam. I hope you are coming with a flying color. Go on. Send it over to you. You can unmute. You can unmute. You can't hear me? Sir, I can hear you, sir. I think yeah, you... I think you can unmute. You unmute, Send You unmute everybody. You allow him to unmute. Send yes, Raj, unmute everybody. I can unmute. No, it is not. Yeah, it is not unmuted. Everybody is muted now. You better. You do it okay. one more time. Yes, sir. 
I given the permission to all of them, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute. I enable the source. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go on, Sendel. See, you are uh, you are uh, muting. Yeah, uh, go on, Sendel. So good afternoon, sir. Uh, we're very lucky to be a part of this class sir, after a long time. And uh, as you asked, uh, it was very helpful to brush up. It was covering from the basics to the point, from uh, like the oncological principles were touched and basic physiology about dumpings and the surgical principles about reconstruction. Everything was made very clear and easy. So it was very helpful. And uh, I had a, a, a small question during the dumping discussion, sir. I feel yeah. like uh, if the candidates usually, when I was an undergraduate, I had a question, how do you differentiate between uh, early dumping and late dumping? And can you explain it in one word they asked me? Mm. So if, if I was able to get an answer, so all my friends, undergraduate friends would be very easy because usually the early and late dumping, it is very confusing in undergraduate level. Yeah, I think the early early dumping is mainly because of the increased transit. See, the transit from the stomach into the small intestine, it is higher. Because of that, especially if you have like a carbohydrate-rich or a high osmolar food, then it causes, okay, intestinal hurry. And because of that, the patient will present with the diarrhea. That is usually the, the main thing. Whereas... A late dumping, usually the late dumping is because of the, I think mostly the insulin response. So usually they present with the hypoglycemia. So for example, normally within an hour, I mean, you start feeling fainting appearance, fainted or like that, then it is a late dumping. But I think the problem, people get used to the dumping very often. It is the early dumping, which they are used to. That's why you always tell, Anybody who's having a gastrectomy done, we always ask them to have a small frequent meal. Don't take a large carbohydrate rich food in a larger quantity in a given time. You have to just make a small frequent meal so you don't dump so that the chances of you having an intestinal hurry problem of this will be minimized. That's what we, this is the practical advice we give to most of them. Anything else you want to add, Sentil? Because uh, you might have had some clues from your uh, postgraduate teachers in Kolkata, my friends there. Yes, sir. It was, uh, Kolkata is very interesting, so thanks for sending me here. Good, good, and, good. Uh, during MRCS exams also, and also for my friends here, NEET, uh, NEET they have a uh, very specific pattern of asking questions. And in all those MRCS and NEET questions where we face MCQs, they ask this uh, uh, early response is uh, osmotic, more towards early dumping is because of osmotic changes yeah. and late dumping is because of hormonal changes. So yeah. they expect this one more. Good, good. Uh, so Let me just uh, tell the undergraduates, the important is at your level undergraduates, as far as the examiner, actually the viva is a very key component, especially if postgraduates are concerned. Whereas the undergraduates, I think, if you are able to just say something relevant to that particular uh, question, but still it is always nice to listen to the examiner's complete question because sometimes the examiner like me, we coin the question for a specific reason. If I say, please tell me the investigation of choice, if I use that word, that means I'm asking for one investigation. Or what are the investigations done for a CA stomach? Then you can enumerate list of investigations. So like that, you need to just listen to the examiner until he finishes a question. Then you don't hesitate. The very important thing, most of the, I mean, undergraduates, I feel, you speak about the, the maximum time you, between the examiner asking question, you answering five seconds, I say. Within the five seconds, you just start telling uh, overall. You can tell. So there are uh, various, you can tell the headings, like the investigations for CA stomach can be grouped under hematological or imaging, and also specific under staging investigation, sir, like that. Because that will give you some breathing space to know, recollect what you want to say. Then you can tell, then uh, examiner, if you see if the examiner is in a hurry, he wants a specific answer, then you can see. But as far as the exam concerned, he wants what's in the barium mill, what's in the endoscopy, or what's CT. So these are the key important findings. Don't waste your time. But 
if if you want to go because undergraduates is all going about you have to use a pattern when you examine you always say inspection palpation percussion auscultation or when you are writing so it's always you have to get the headings right you always go for a differential diagnosis and then you give the final diagnosis and uh, in post graduates we don't say uh, some it is if it is a thyroid is enlarged i can feel the thyroid rather than telling there is an organ palpable right in front of the tracheal i don't vague terminology you specific they so they go on to the topic the post graduates but you have to be system specific in other words we have to see if i leave my undergraduates in my as a resident in my department he can take a good history he can investigate and he can present to me tomorrow in the ward round that's a way if i give a post graduates yes he can summarize the whole thing when i go to the ward round he can tell exactly what i need from him so like that. so each one's requirement is different accordingly you need to be trained so and i think in a way we are selfish in that way that we do that way i think vaishnavi you can ask now i think she raised her hand now let us ask vaishnavi soma sundaram over to you yes vaishnavi unmute yourself i think she raised her hand for uh, just to start or anybody else or any questions from your end rajaram or we'll go quickly so nothing sir yeah because i want to finish 12:30 on time today because i don't want to take too long like last time so i have to promise yeah, rpn is ready to ask some question i think so. yeah yeah Karthi yeah okay yeah, well. yeah go sir, on good afternoon sir yes kartikeyan go on sir what are the palliative procedures sir yes well done see i miss see the certain times i was concentrating more on d2 palliation is very good question see there are two palliations we do but for example when what is the patient say what is palliation it is a relief of patient's prime symptom what is the key symptom of the patient you have to understand the patient in the ca stomach especially distal gastric cancer the commonest thing is vomiting they are not able to eat properly so you have to palliate so what are the surgical palliation you need to divert the food so what is the palliation we did for carcinoma stomach we put a self expanding metal stent so that it made them to eat like this phage is relieved here vomiting to relieve so you need to do a palliative gastro jejunostomy the gastro jejunostomy palliation is usually made is very simple by anterior gj what is anterior gj it is anti colic anterior gj we do what but still patient will have a tumor there isn't it so that's why people say if you are able to remove the tumor and then do a palliation that is also possible that is called you do a not a toilet gastrectomy you do a resection gastrectomy like a r1 gastrectomy you can palliate also you do not do a extensive d2 gastrectomy so palliative gastrectomy d2 gast i mean palliative bilroth 2 gastrectomy or palliative gastro jejunostomy for undergraduate level if you write palliative anterior gj that is good enough in my opinion okay you understand okay, yeah thank good. you sir okay. what is who is the next one rajaram no, no sir not yet sir okay continue okay. the next session okay so we'll start screening a uh, screen share again So just yes can you hear me now yes sir yeah okay right let's see see this actually is very very important as a clinician when you are a crri or later or so there may be a short notes acid peptic disease because acid peptic disease is actually a medical problem what is the role of surgeon only i'm going to enlighten here because it's not a surgeon's disease ca stomach of course is purely a surgeon's disease but we also know the acid peptic disease apd is because of apd if you remember that as well and good because those days we say because of the hydrochloric acid we develop ulcer hyper acidity no acid no ulcer was the concept before so acidity is still a cause because one of the classical example is zollinger ellison syndrome 
hyper acidity so you get an ulcer even not only in the duodenum down in the jejunum also sometimes second commonest for all of you is h pylori organism that is a very very important thing you need to understand third of course is sometimes it is the diet you eat take or also drugs you take we always say the drugs commonest drug is non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like the diclofenac all the people old age people with the arthritis taking the oviron diclofenac brufen thing like that and also people taking steroids for rheumatoid arthritis things like that and also you have to remember lot of people because of the hurry always very fast living life or stress worry or spicy food curry so hurry worry and curry i normally say causing this so these are all in essence the reason why we develop can i mean the ulcer as you can see here this is actually pylorus this is a spot of the stomach where there is an ulcer pre pyloric or antral region there is a benign looking ulcer this is duodenum multiple ulcers this is the way you see in your endoscopy as far as you are concerned undergraduates remember gastric ulcers especially when they are benign they happen in the lesser curvature usually in the incisura region if the ulcer in the stomach if it is more than 2 cm take it down more than 2 cm or in the proximal stomach or along the greater curvature they have a more likelihood of malignancy okay so these are the three things whereas other ulcers usually especially small ulcers less than 2 cm along the lesser curve especially in the incisor or region or in the pre pyloric region like what you saw just now they are usually due to h pylori organism duodenal ulcer the commonest duodenal ulcer is almost always in the duodenal bulb that is the first part of duodenum not the second third fourth part the second third part sometimes you have a duodenal ulcer only if you are having what is called i already told the jolinger ellison syndrome the first part of duodenum it has an anterior wall posterior wall if you have an anterior wall ulcer if it advances it can cause duodenal ulcer perforation one of the commonest cause for perforative peritonitis whereas posterior ulcer in the duodenum if you remember your anatomy the first part of duodenum the posterior relation is the gastro duodenal artery so posterior ulcer cause penetration to the gastro duodenal artery so it bleeds torrentially at times so posterior ulcer bleeds anterior ulcer perforates very common so if you have a patient with perforative peritonitis it is a anterior du if you have a patient with hematemesis melina it could be a gastric ulcer duodenal ulcer but if it is a massive bleeding suspect posterior duodenal ulcer okay sometimes like two friends together there may be anterior and posterior ulcer and kissing at the top like a roof they are called a kissing ulcer anterior ulcer posterior ulcer but duodenal ulcers are always benign whereas gastric ulcers i told you already if they are large they can be an cancer or a benign ulcer can also can turn into malignancy but it is theoretical but at your level you can still consider that's why whenever you see a gastric ulcer one has to do a biopsy to prove whether it is benign or not and i told you already peptic ulcer disease is a benign problem treatment is medical okay like a acid suppression by giving drugs like a h2 blocker or proton pump inhibitor whereas if it's developing complication the surgeon comes in in the treatment of only complication of acid peptic disease like bleeding upper gi bleeding like hematemesis or melina or perforative peritonitis or gastric outlet obstruction the third one only we are going to see today as a short notes h pylori how many of you know about h pylori take it from me the important areas you have to remember it is a gram negative bacilli motile it is flagellated okay it highly motile organisms it is urease producing organism with the only organisms okay having this capacity to thrive in the 
hostile acid environment of the stomach no organism if you eat food contaminated food it is all sterilized thanks to the hydrochloric acid but if you have the h pylori it is able to thrive in the hostile acid acid environment how it is possible thanks to the urease we'll come to that in a minute and also it is the sole responsible reason why we develop so commonly the ulcer in the stomach and also in the duodenum we have to remember some personalities i always fond of personalities beard or till i mean the the i mean uh, like bilroth theodor bilroth as far as the stomach is concerned i told you and also the iver lewis esophagus i told you these two names never forget third as far as the stomach is concerned at least you remember this chap you know who is this you know anybody is this is australian guy okay so he the marshall and rubin warren both of them they actually identified and they described that in this is the small miniature version of your stomach with the its rugal folds and the the parietal cells so you see this acid in the stomach but this all these organisms they are able to thrive okay how they are able to thrive this organisms because of the urease they have they are able to convert the urea in the surrounding region to ammonia so because of the ammonia production around each organisms each organism is able to have a micro alkali environment so in the midst of acid h it is able to produce alkali around it thanks to the urease it is possessing so if the urease it constantly produces by converting the urea into ammonia and it is able to thrive and it multiplies and it causes destruction of the organisms so it causes gastritis enteral gastritis duodenitis and of course ulcer later and because of that it has dyspepsia how will you diagnose i told you the same template you use they present sometimes because of the hematemesis or melina with a microcytic anemia in abroad they used to do a test called serology like what we do for example even for covid they say you do antibody test same way there is an antibody for h pylori also available we can do that or you can do a non invasive test there is another test called urea breath test also we can do but most important thing as far as you are concerned is in barium we used to do in the past we will show you a notch a speck of barium at the ulcer bed and also there is a peristalsis there is a peristalsis opposite direction if you have a ulcer in the along the lesser curvature you will have a small niche and then notch or a peristalsis here so niche and notch is a barium meal finding and a special investigation of course is endoscopy endoscopy is a investigation of choice not only for ca stomach for all upper abdominal symptoms or even for acid peptic disease and there in addition to biopsy we do also an or test called a rapid urease test or campylobacter like organism test that is clot test or rut test see what is rut test what we do see here is a small demonstration i'm doing an endoscopy i'm already in the duodenum you can see the duodenum d2 because you see the horizontal valvule conjunctivitis i am withdrawing the endoscopy i am now back into the d1 that is a duodenal bulb here here is the as uh, uh, there is a posterior duodenal ulcer actually this is a this is the normal looking i mean duodenal anterior wall here is a large ulcer slough ulcer you can see some blood here dark blood here so large ulcer you can see about 3 cm duodenal ulcer and also there is another ulcer superior ulcer so it is actually two ulcers in the same patient now what we are doing we have now into the antrum of the stomach in the antrum of the stomach imagine this particular patient the duodenal ulcer is because of h pylori in the antrum of the stomach okay there are also some mild gastritis so we'll do a test that is called h pylori test what is h pylori test when i am in the stomach i take a biopsy from the antrum and put it in the small slide like this where the when you put the yellow color will change into pink color why yellow changes to pink because the ammonia production and with the presence of phenolphthalein because any presence of alkali the phenolphthalein indicator will change the area into pink so 
urease enzyme the rapid urease enzyme i mean what is the rapid urea test because of the presence of the urease enzyme the urea here in the indicator we are providing okay is changed into ammonia thanks to the urease enzyme because you have already put the specimen inside okay so because of the ammonia is produced this ammonia being alkali is converted converting the phenolphthalein okay presence of indicator makes it pink color so within 10 to 20 seconds you have an color indication it is a highly sensitive specific but it is a invasive test so a rapid urease test needs endoscopy which is the invasive investigation whereas urea breath test is a non endoscopic non invasive test very very important what is it you just give the patient carbon radio carbon tagged urea you just give a tablet a carbon tagged tablet also patient to take or a drink so this carbon 13 tagged urea when it goes here imagine it is in the presence of urease enzyme if it is present especially if the h pylori is present it will join with what it will join with the it will produce ammonia of course you yeah, know because of the urease enzyme so this ammonia okay and the carbonic acid development this is it, because the car, the carbon dioxide okay here it will be exhaled through the lung okay so this particular co2 see carbonic acid see ammonia carbonic acid again it goes into the lung it exhales as a carbon dioxide this carbon of the carbon dioxide will have the same carbon of the urea so this is the basis of this urea breath test so you just to test the patient's breath whether he has a carbon tagged so this is a radio isotope study in a way is one of the extents of the radio isotope study very simple there are hundreds of radio isotope study this is simplest of the simple radio isotope radio nucleotide study heli probe study we use it once you prove what is the importance like a tuberculosis here also we use a triple therapy a combination of two antibiotics like one of the two amoxicillin clarithromycin is a common combination sometimes if the patient is allergic to amoxicillin you may consider metronidazole or etinidazole so two antibiotics with the one proton pump inhibitor like a rabiprazole okay or pantoprazole any of the five prazoles we use of sufficient dosage for sufficient duration that is two weeks duration very very important okay two weeks of triple drug when you give there is about 90% remission from the ulcer disease otherwise you have a high chance of recurrence from this ulcer patient what about treatment we used to do in the past like a bagotomy gastrectomy for a benign gastric ulcer they are all find you can find them only in the books we don't do any truncal bagotomy selective bagotomy highly selective bagotomy those are all on the books even a bilrath one gastrectomy i told you explain it for benign gastric ulcer we seldom do unless the patient has some major complication so that takes me to an important complication which we'll discuss today that is goo gastric outlet obstruction like a urologist they'll say bladder outlet obstruction boo they say like that we say gastric outlet obstruction because this is a very very important uh, short case or a important patient you have to identify because gastric outlet obstruction there are various causes even a, a baby four four weeks old baby will present with a projectile vomiting of every feed it is having because of a congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis but the common cause is chronic duodenal ulcer thanks to the ppi we don't see that many cases but still we have some cases coming uh, especially with the classical visible gastric peristalsis as a sign neoplasia also for a differential diagnosis you have to see distal gastric cancer also you have to consider ca head of pancreas also can present rarely as a gastric outlet obstruction so the problem here you have to understand the pathology in goo pathology is somewhere here in the gastric outlet okay it is a benign ulcer or a malignant ulcer or carcinoma head of pancreas or congenital pyloric stenosis whatever it is the problem is here because of the obstruction mechanical obstruction the food is not able to go so all the food remains here undigested food 
so the stomach keeps on distending the capacity of the stomach over a period of many months becomes from 1 liter to 2 liter 200 of liters this is very very important for you to understand so the stomach is distended stomach always has a undigested food and when the patient vomits he vomits large quantum of undigested food undigested food he had not only this morning from previous day yesterday's food if he vomits it is a sign of gastric outlet obstruction okay because if you understand visualize it you'll be able to understand the pathology under finding so if you listen to a patient patient will tell doctor every day i have a good appetite no problem but i have some burning or discomfort after eating i can eat my breakfast i can eat my lunch but during my dinner time i feel i feel full i feel so uncomfortable i feel like vomiting i even i put my hand into my tongue i make myself vomit because only then i feel i am comfortable going to bed and sleep because the stomach is so full because it never emptied itself from its food it had from the morning all the food he vomits first at dinner then the lunch the last thing he is surprised to find the even the breakfast is there in his food and it is per projectile so voluminous and he becomes so patient if you imagine you vomit every food like a bulimia then you have a rapid loss of weight you become very dehydrated in a matter of few days so that's why you visualize a patient who is vomiting everything every day then you can see a patient standing in front of you very emaciated very dehydrated so you have to write all the findings of dehydrated patient like a dry ask the patient to put out the tongue dry tongue indrawn cheek sunken eye skin ridges if you see the skin you see the elasticity all, all of you love elasticity but here it will be a 60 or 70 year old old man the skin will remain like a ridge skin ridge appearance all those things you have to write as undergraduate these are the clinical signs of dehydration then examination of the abdomen inspection fullness in the epigastric region palpation our inspection if you see along the tangential inspection of especially after tapping the stomach you will be able to see the visible gastric peristalsis peristalsis moving from the patient's left hand to the right hand side okay through the peristaltic wave whether it is a step ladder peristaltic pattern of the intestinal vip or vgp very commonly asked question but nowadays all this vgp is very seldom we see because those cases are rare these types of cases nowadays but if you have a classical case you'll be able to see these two classical signs you are expected to tell in the exam visible gastric peristalsis then you put your stethoscope, shake the patient and you'll be able to auscultate the stethoscope, the two and four movement of the food in the stomach giving you that classical succession flash. So these are the two signs you will see. If you imagine this is not the barium, but this is actually a CT, but this is the stomach, the whole, this is the whole, I mean the abdomen, you can see Three fourths of the abdomen is filled with a huge stomach. You can be, I have seen some patients, the whole abdomen is only stomach. The small intestine, transverse colon, everything is in the pelvic region. So when they vomit, you can see the vomitous amount. Or when you put a rail tube, you'll be surprised that one bucket full, it is not one kidney dish full, one bucket will be full of fluid. So that amount of fluid they will have. So acute gastric dilatation, that is called a very distended dilated stomach is a classical radiological finding even in the plain x-ray or if you do a ct you will see in the ct or even if you put a rails tube you will find out so what are the biochemical findings classical this is a very important finding especially post graduate will ask you but it is easy for you to understand the patient will be vomiting all acid all chloride hydrochloric acid so there will be decreased chloride in the hypochloremic alkalosis because acid is gone so alcohol very easy to understand so that but the very important thing is how will you replenish this patient's electrolyte imbalance if you ask you you just give the patient normal saline okay unless patient has very low potassium there is no need to give potassium to stop it because our body will correct the potassium potassium is mainly in the intracellular problem in the extracellular problem it is the sodium you are worried about so you have to chloride you are worried about so hypochloramic alkalosis is the 
very important biochemical change you will find out so what treatment normal saline normal saline and normal saline you give otherwise what will happen if you treat the un, leave the patient untreated patient will die of hyponatremia hypokalemia and hyperuricemia the urea will go that is called a pre renal failure then they'll go for established renal failure that is the way so you have to hydrate then only that's why we always say you have to resuscitate the patient then only you have to treat the patient okay uh, whether you do a barium meal no need because here the ct itself will say those days we see delayed emptying the stomach will remain with the barium even after 3 hours because whatever barium you give to any patient that has to be emptied by a maximum 3 hours 2 hours usually 3 hours you give even after 3 hours if your barium is present in your stomach that means patient has having a some degree of gastric stasis whether the gastric stasis is mechanical or neurological if it is mechanical it is a gastric outlet obstruction like this case if it is neurological problem is the gastroparesis like a diabetic gastroparesis or there are a humpty number of neurological conditions can cause as a set ct nowadays we very usually feel but endoscopy will give you the classical diagnosis see here is a classical case when we do a endoscopy uh, you go and you see a lot of fluid see normally the stomach has to be empty one of the important thing for undergraduates when you send a patient for a gastroscopy patient has to be fasted for 6 hours nil by mouth if they are 6 hours nil by mouth mouth this patient was overnight 12 hours nil by mouth but still is having so much of fluid that means gastric stasis and is having a tumor you can see a tumor ulcerated tumor and that is a reason for uh, his gastric outlet obstruction the treatment as we rightly said is gastrojejunostomy like what we did a palliative gastrojejunostomy for a cs stomach similar one anterior gj is treatment but before that i told you three things if you remember the pathology clinical finding patient is dehydrated so rehydrate that dehydrated patient with the saline patient has a distended stomach so empty the distended stomach by putting a rail stew patient has an obstructed stomach so you divert the food by doing a bypass like a plumbing like gastrojejunostomy if you understand the pathology if you understand and visualize the problem and you will be able to execute the treatment is a piece of cake for you once you understand that so i think we are bang on time hopefully so to take home here dyspepsia is a common problem we dealt only two of the the tip of the iceberg is of course ca stomach and acid peptic disease but always remember to take the step alarm symptom like a significant weight loss family history advise them for early endoscopy the second important thing is whenever a patient has a dyspepsia investigation of choice is of course endoscopy and biopsy ct abdomen is very very important for staging investigation for ca stomach for any cancer for that matter ct is more important than ultrasound nowadays and for ca stomach radical d2 gastrectomy is a treatment if anybody ask you what is a treatment for ca stomach that word is very very important the d2 is more important than the word gastrectomy because anybody even a nurse can tell gastrectomy or even patient says i have come for gastrectomy doctor but the d2 what is d2 it is the d2 group of lymph nodes group 2 lymph nodes that is a station number 1 to 11 lymph node station as for the japanese classification or removed or perigastric periceliac axis branches those celiac artery branches if you know well and tell well you tell otherwise you tell the branches around the perigastric branches arteries like left gastric splenic all the branches of splenic artery i mean celiac artery you know well and good the next is h pylori you understand the pathogenesis of duodenal ulcer the importance of h pylori detection and eradication with a triple therapy and q that is gastric outlet obstruction needs iv saline rails tube insertion and gastrojejunostomy that brings us to an important thing there is a question time 
If there any questions, I'll allow about three questions. Then we'll go for a MCQ. I told you, I think five questions, simple questions. If you get five out of five, that means you have understood all. You go home happily, revise the day before the exam. Three, better you see the exam. I mean, one more time, the same thing in the YouTube. If you get only one, probably you need to concentrate or you probably join in the middle. So this is the thing. For a postgraduate, you have to get six out of five. So probably central you may have to take. So you have to add more than one because this is the question is very simple, too simple for you. Anyhow, there are two hands raised. Unmute everybody. Start asking questions, Rajaram. Yes, sir. So everyone, Reshma, you can ask the question. Oh. Just a minute. Sir, can you can you unmute yourself, sir? My sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. I. Okay. Sir, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Please. I could not hear you, sir. Sir. Sendil, you ask question first. Wait, wait a minute. I'll, I'll. Sendil, you ask question. You want to add anything? Or Reshma is raised a hand. Both of them can answer one after other. Can you hear me, Sendil? Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. Yeah, uh, you, you go. Fire away. You are. You have something to say? Um, uh, yes, sir. Uh, it was clearly done, sir. I would like to add points for my friends so that they can be uh, using it for NEET exam, sir. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. Yes, sir. Uh, they, uh, I faced a lot of questions when I was writing NEET and they asked about paradoxical aciduria in gastric outlet affection, sir, the physiology behind it. Mm. And uh, as the electrolytes we were discussing, the so hypochloremic uh, aciduria, they asked two questions. So the first question is paradoxical aciduria and why. So I would want my friends to focus on that because it is one of the favorite questions when we have answered all these things. The next question from by the examiner will be why paradoxical aciduria. Okay, good. And so some homework for them to do. So we'll give them as a homework. We don't give the answer right away. Okay, you give fire away the question. Any other question? And, because that, uh, that, the, last because, question, sir. Yeah, I want to just because you are there mainly to tell them the standard we need to set in. So you give them so that this is not the limit. You can go for higher up. So you give one or two questions so that they can brush up, they prepare themselves. Then that will they'll be, they'll be able to retain and understand. Yes. Thank Anything you. else, Sandal? Before I go to somebody else. Okay. I'll be adding the uh, last point for uh, neat exams and for the uh, the bonus round in. Viva, uh, Viva also, sir, in there. Uh, yeah. So, uh, apart from paradoxical aciduria, I would like to add on the most favorite question by the examiners and also in MCQs is why not ringer lactate in resuscitation of gastric outlet obstruction? Or any okay. alkalosis patient, why not ringer lactate is one of the favorite questions. Sir. Okay. So, Good. we're not letting the answers out. Uh, I hope uh, students will be pondering on this point. Sir. But both the questions, in my opinion, they are only for, not for undergraduates, for NEET or also for postgraduates. Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely for NEET. NEET, NEET, yeah. sir, NEET. Because otherwise, they'll be wondering. Because they have to go into the applied biochemistry that, that needs a separate section by itself. But I, I am sure there are people interested here. They may uh, refer and they get ready now itself. Reshma, you are waiting a long time. Go on. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, you are from? Sir, I am from Kanyakumari. Yeah, go on, Reshma. Uh, sir, uh, why do we get hypoglycemia in dumping? Sir? Why do we? Yes. Yeah, because so of the insulin. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes, sir. It is mainly because of the insulin. See, early, see, you, you get the absorption. For example, there is an increased glucose surge in the blood because of earlier absorption. See, the digestion happens so quickly and uh, so rapidly. So there is an increase in glucose, a response to the, I mean, the increase of glucose in the blood. Of course, the insulin response is immediate, but it is 
more than uh, what is required. So there is no match. There is a mismatch between the insulin and also the glucose. So insulin causes immediately a glucose suppression. So uh, early glucose rise, insulin, and that, that causes hypoglycemia. That is the main important thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Next. Sir, Karthi Gayan. Karthi Gayan, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Karthi Gayan. Rajaram. Yes, sir. You unmute everybody. I think there is a confusion here. Okay. Huh? You can uh, everybody unmuted because only people with the questions uh, they have to raise. I mean, ask uh, one after other. Right? You unmute everybody, including me. Okay. Are you able to do Kardiya? And you are able to unmute yourself from your end. I think you mute. Sir, he can. Do it, sir, but he didn't do that. Yeah, Karthikeyan can. You can. Everybody can unmute yourself if you want to ask question. Otherwise, I'll go to the questions now. Okay, let us go. Rajaram, can you hear me now? Yes. yes okay. So now there are five questions. Ideal investigation to know resectability of CA stomach. Okay, which one you'll choose if it is for your final year exam? It is not a need exam standard, it is a less than that standard, very simple one, but at least endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound, CT abdomen with IV contrast, PET CT. If you have chosen CT abdomen with IV contrast because it gives you not only the TNF staging, resectability, very important thing, vascular invasion, local invasion, both can be easily diagnosed by, thanks to the CT abdomen with IV, very important is IV contrast, because only then the vessels will be delineated nicely, okay. Next, gastro-deodinal continuity, in other words, the anatomy is back to normal, after which type of gastrectomy? I have given you four types of gastrectomy. Bilroth 1, 2, D2 gastrectomy, RU and Y anastomosis. In which one gastro-deodinal continuity is restored? Of course, this is a very simple question. This is Bilroth 1. True or false? In staging CA stomach, MRI is useful to find out any peritoneal metastasis. Now high-end MRI, CT people claim, but for exam purpose, you have to see the staging laparoscopy is the investigation of choice for peritoneal metastasis. MRI is not, so it is a false answer. Urea breath test is an invasive test with high specificity, sensitivity to diagnose H. pylori infection. This is the statement I am making. Here the statement is true in the way urea breath test is a highly sensitive specific, but it is non-invasive. So part of the statement is wrong. So it is a false statement. So here the question, I mean, take home message is always you have to read the whole statement, understand each and particular thing. For example, they'll write urea breath test is a non-invasive test with low sensitivity and specificity like that they'll put. Okay, non-invasive, right, but about the specificity, so in other words, they are trying to get two aspects of your knowledge from one question, like that they can make more and more complex questions. So the construction of the question on undergraduates, postgraduate, and uh, things are, can get the same concept. But once you get the concept right, I think easily you can, so you, all of you have to go back to understand these two terminologies today. What is sensitivity? What is specificity? Explain in your own words. Give some classical example because that can be asked in Viva anytime during your tenure, during undergraduates or postgraduates. Next is 
in case of gastric outlet obstruction blood biochemistry will show hyperchloremic alkalosis so here don't think it is a spelling mistake sometimes they'll ask you in a hurry you say everything is fine so it is all hypochloremic alkalosis is the right answer so it is actually a false statement so like that you have to be very assertive also sometimes in a hurry like all oh, right i know that so don't be in a hurry read full read every line and hidden but the examiner is not that to deceive you he is trying to tell i mean find out how complete your understanding of that particular concept of this particular thing so that's the way things are go i think uh, and this is i think we have already crossed well over the time uh, and the next two module uh, is going to be on small bowel i think the next module is this dyspepsia is over so we are going to approach to diarrhea i think we'll next one we'll take is a diarrhea and there we'll discuss on inflammatory bowel disease inflammatory bowel disease like crohn's disease ulcerative colitis may not be a very common problem but as we go small bowel cancers are uncommon in my opinion so under ileocecal tuberculosis may be a short notes for you so those things can be all grouped together as a uh, small bowel disease and finish it on one day then module 4 will go to a large bowel as approach to constipation and a large bowel cancer so like that symptom based approach then we will i mean collectively we will finish few few topics so that's the way i think we can finish the whole surgery in my it is a tough job but we'll try to finish in uh, 30 challenging modules so we are finishing and uh, miles to go before we sleep and uh, have a relaxing rest of the sunday and uh, brush up all those things i think sendel and all other people uh, told you and uh, thank you very much and uh, any feedback from the uh, people admin admins from the perundur medical college coimbatore medical college other medical colleges quite welcome to express their feedback i think rajaram you want to say something about the feedback yes, form yes sir yes sir you can tell now sir, before that we can have some uh, participants raising their hand yeah uh, Go on. Can yeah i'll stop sharing the slide Yes. Uh, Satya Gandhi, I think I made your. Uh, yeah, Satya Gandhi. Friends, How are you? Friends, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you? My, my friends, sir. You are from which college? Sir, I am from Bengal University. Okay, okay. Are you having a on-site class, or still it is all you are also having online class? Because I was told by your professor they are also planning for an online class. Has it started for you, or yet to start? Sir, started for sir. Okay, surgery also. I have done a surgery class also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. So, sir, did you? Professor. How did you find today class? And any questions on that? You tell me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, my question is, sir, see, see, stomach after the. Surgery, the medication and the post-operative advice for the patient. Post-operative advice after surgery, gastrectomy. Yes, sir. You want to say, and, sir, and uh, any restriction for the food intake, sir, after surgery. Yeah, I, as, as as we already said, whenever you have a gastrectomy, the patient is going to have small gastric reservoir, and also there is a problem of dumping syndrome. and also there is going to be a, a degree of indigestion so you need to give them a small quantity food small meal okay and also you have to make sure they are not having high osmolality so low osmolar of food and uh, energy i mean you have to give them a protein rich food so you need to titrate in other words i will make sure this patient is counseled by a dietitian ideal world in abroad they usually send them to a dietitian so they'll give a prescription meal because a dietitian job is to see your way of eating every day what how many meals you day what is your likely i mean food habits what are the favorite food in that one they have to make a custom made food plan that is called a food plan but the food plan is the quantity should be less frequency it should be more and it should be an high protein diet and it should not have high salted content because if you have a high osmolality so he especially in the initial phase like high if you write rice kanji carbohydrate the high rice kanji it will just flush through the whole stomach and patient has to rush to the toilet so those things sometimes you have to tell the patient this is a small price to pay if you have 
hydrate yourself you give them ors or some some rehydration therapy also you have to give significant weight loss is a problem for all gastrectomy patients if you want to lose weight one of the thing people say is sleeve gastrectomy remove part of your stomach isn't it so stomach loss of stomach patient will lose already patient with the stomach cancer will be lost so further he is going to have a significant weight loss unless you are going to take care initially wound healing is better only you will give take care of the patients protein nutrition so you have to give them adequate amount of protein so the important biochemical thing usually we say do, before surgery or immediate post operative look at the patient's serum albumin serum albumin is an indirect indicator of how is your wound healing is going to be your wound healing your anastomosis everything will be good if your serum albumin is good that's why we always say you have to look at the patient serum protein serum albumin level before you submit the patient for any surgery for hemoglobin the hemoglobin should be ideally above ideally above 8 8 grams normally you know all of us 12 to 15 but don't give everybody transfusion as long as it is below 10 we have threshold for transfusion this is called threshold for transfusion normally for a surgeon is 8 grams if it is 8 grams and above then you prepare the patient for pack cells because hemoglobin is important albumin is important but for albumin don't give patient see i mean iv albumin iv albumin will go through the vein come through the kidney so it will not help you have to give patient food white of the egg for example egg white is very very good albumin okay like that you have to find the albumin rich food or protein rich food which easily digestible for the patient to take in small quantity so these are all the some so as we go for example in a small bowl when he come Uh, we'll i'll we'll discuss more on the dietary aspects okay anybody else satya i hope you have understood some extent on diet it is a comprehensive aspect we'll discuss further in the next class also on the dietary aspects okay anybody else raja ram yes sir yeah anushikita you can hey, anush yeah anushikita from uh, good morning sir i am from e road sir Yes, tell me, Anushikita, how are you? How did you find the class, yes, and where did you attend the last class also? Yes, sir, I attended, sir. Okay, I request all of you, right? I mean, fill in the Google form because we are planning to get a certification for all of you. How many modules you have done, and also your feedback. So that so that we can follow. There is a where you fill in your phone number and also email ID. We'll have a call. I'm trying to get into the our uh, Tamil Nadu. I mean, the medical university, M J R Medical University. Will whether we'll be able to get a credit points. Uh, but if it is not, I, it's not a guarantee. But we'll I'll try. But at least from our aspect from our association we will be able to say that you have attended so many modules i think it is of whatever value that is will be there definitely it will help you immensely for your exam so that's by the way so you fill in your feedback form when sent to you by my manager raja ram yes over to you anushka what what question you have sir which treatment is uh, best for carcinoma stomach sir subtotal or total gastrectomy sir it all depends upon the location of the tumor and the clearance if it is a distal gastric cancer for example antrum of the stomach okay then you do a subtotal gastrectomy leave the fundus of the stomach because gastro jejunostomy is easier than esophago jejunostomy see making an anastomosis between the esophagus to jejunum stomach to jejunum which is easy which is highly vascular organ you know stomach or esophagus Stomach. it is always stomach because you have five different blood supply esophagus like your large intestine it is having a uncertain blood supply actually esophago jejunal anastomosis sometimes go for anastomotic leak whereas gastro jejunal anastomosis seldom go for anastomotic leak thanks to the good blood supply that's why subtotal gastrectomy is preferable if it is possible where it is possible when you have a distal gastric cancer but if you have a proximal gastric cancer where the proximal stomach has to be removed so obviously you have to do total gastrectomy okay so that's why a total gastrectomy for all body and proximal stomach proximal stomach cancer total gastrectomy distal gastric cancer you can consider subtotal gastrectomy 
that is for undergraduate answer thank you sir okay next anybody else um, no sir so like conclude sir yes thank you very much all of you go and have something to eat send the take care of yourself i hope you all recovered from this uh, 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 i think it's a rainy season i don't know the months who started after all this uh, uh, things but take care i think uh, my friends in calcutta all the calcutta medical college my senior colleagues were all telling uh, some parts of the calcutta is really bad with electricity internet gone for nearly a week or more so take care i think uh, covid is secondary problem now but uh, i think it's still in uh, metros and it's going to be a part of our life i think we have to start living our new normal this is a new normal way of uh, learning surgery also uh, uh, at least undergraduates is better for post graduates i always pity the third year post graduate who is itching to go and do gastrectomy and thing like that in theater they may not be able to at hands on experience i think that's where i think the real trouble is going to be anyhow as a trainer we try to do whatever we can do from our things uh, to help you to come out through uh, in a flying color in the examination so goodbye all of you see you next sunday same time same uh, place thank you bye bye yeah, bye bye all of you sir thank you so yeah, much thank you thank you for presenting today i hope your lecture has been very useful to the participants who really wants to enrich their knowledge in surgery and all your slides are helping to understand more easily sir i request all the participants to give your feedback which i posted in the chat box your feedback is more valuable for us kindly post it and the youtube video of the session will be available in the same link kindly forward to your friends who have not attended today thank you thank you sir once again to you meet you on next sunday bye thank bye you bye. sir bye.